The next algorithm we're going to look at is called Grover's algorithm, which was devised by Lou Grover in 1996. Now, just like the Deut-Yoza algorithm, the Grover algorithm uses qubits in superposition in parallel universes to make its computation. But unlike the Deut-Yoza algorithm, instead of just finding out whether a function's constant or balanced, it can perform searches, which have many applications in computer science, and can do so much faster than classical computers. So let's take a, a look at that a bit more closely. So as I mentioned before, Grover's algorithm is an unstructured search. Now, what do I mean by that? So let's imagine we have a list from 1 to n that contains a number of items. What we're looking for is a particular item in the list. In this case, it would be w if we're looking for a 1. Now, a classical computer, in the worst case, the fastest it can solve this is an O of n time. And the reason for this is if we imagine the, what we're, the item we're looking for to be in the last position on the list, then in the worst case, we have to look through every item in the list before we find what we're looking for. Now what Grover's algorithm can do is solve this question in O of square root of n time, which is a very big speed up from classical computers. If we would imagine n would be a million, then the, a classical computer could solve it in a million steps, while Grover's algorithm could solve it in a thousand steps, which is, as you can see, a very big speed up. So just like the Deut-Yoza problem, what we're going to do is have an oracle function, which we're going to put qubits in superposition through. Now what this oracle function does for an unstructured search is very simple. It outputs 0 if the input is x, anything we're not looking for. It outputs 1 if the input is w, the value we are looking for. So, for example, if we were to be looking for w equals 0, 0, the oracle function would output 1 for 0, 0, and 0 for every other value. Now, by using the amplitude, and by multiplying at the amplitudes that this oracle function creates, we're able to output what the correct w we're looking for is. So let's look at an implementation of this on the, the simulator. So here we have a simple circuit implementation for solving Grover's algorithm. And what this is doing is it's searching for the input 0, 0, which is what we were examining in the last slide. So where the 0, 0 is encoded is in these two oracle functions right here, which we have to invoke twice because n is equal to 4 in this case, and our runtime is the square root over n, which is equal to 2. So we have to invoke the oracle twice. Now, just like the deutsch yoza algorithm, Grover's algorithm has three different steps that it does. The first is to put the qubits through Hadamard gates to put them in superposition, which is similar to what we've been doing in the other video tutorials. And this can be represented by this equation, which essentially says that it's putting the qubits into every different possible input for x. You can represent it here. Now what this does is this, this puts, makes the qubits have a uniform amount of amplitude. So the expectation value of any of the different possible inputs is going to be equal to 25% in this case. Now when we perform the second step of Grover's algorithm, which is putting it through the oracle function, what ends up happening is, as we can see from here, remember this is very similar to Deutsch's al algorithm, if the function, the oracle function evaluates to 1. This means that its eigenvalue is going to be negative 1. But if the input is 
any item that we're not looking for on the list, then the eigenvalue is going to be equal to 1. Now, what this has the effect of doing is flipping the amplitude of just the item that we're looking for, because the, the eigenvalue is now going to be negative 1. And it flips only the, the input that we're looking for and leaves the other how it is. So when we now perform step three of the algorithm, which is perform putting the Hadamard gates again on the qubits after putting them through the Oracle function, what we get is this, which is applying a state change to, to the qubits which once again reflects them or reflects the input that we're looking for around the x value again, which then gives us the, the probability or the amplitude of the input that we're looking for at time t plus 1 once we apply the two, the oracle matrix on it and the, the Hadamard gate again on it. And what this does is it flips the input value we're looking for, but amplifies it and increases it. So now the probability of us, of the expectation value, is going to go up. And when we measure these, these inputs, we're going to have a much higher chance of finding it. So what we do is we then repeat step two and three on each other until the amplitude here reaches close to, to W. And when we take a measurement then, there's going to be a very high probability of the, the result that we got, the observables that we saw from the qubits, are going to be the item that we're looking for. And here we can see the final step then is after we perform steps two and three at t amount of times, we're going to get the amplitude in time t. Now, why is the runtime square root of n? This is now kind of easy to see because the, the amplitude of the item we're looking for is going to increase linearly. But because we're looking at probabilities, and we have to, or we're looking at amplitudes, we have to take the square root of those amplitudes in order to get the desire we're looking for, which is how we get a runtime of square root of n. So now let's actually run the circuit and find out what happens. So just like we were talking about, when we run this only once by invoking the Oracle function two times, we find that this algorithm finds the value we're looking for, 0, 0, with 100% certainty, with a 100% expectation value. Now, if we were to encode a different value that we're looking for, say this one, which we're now looking for 0, 1, if we run this one again, we see that it also finds the value we're looking for with an expectation value of 100%. And if we search for 1, 0, it also finds it. And if we search for 1, 1, it also finds it with an expectation value of 1. And if we want to look at a more complicated version of Grover's algorithm, we find that it can also solve this one, in which case we're looking for 0, 1, 1, 1, 0. So here we have another example of a quantum algorithm that exploits qubits in superposition to make calculations in different parallel universes at the same time and then combines the results at the end. And as I mentioned before, this algorithm can solve problems that a classical computer would solve in a million steps, but Grover's algorithm can solve it in a thousand steps. And this has profound applications for database theory and many different practical uses that we can use it for. And this just goes to show the potential and the power that quantum computing can have on the world.